Hey Facebook, right now I am outside of the session imagining, reimagining reproductive justice. Um, it's Brianna, your social justice ambassador with YTH Live, and I'm excited to head in and see what's going on in the session. I'm going to live stream as, as much of it as possible for you, so let's go. because everybody uses it in Latin America at least and uh, the, these adolescent leaders that we were training uh, to go out and teach the community about uh, contraception and how to prevent pregnancy uh, they decided to use WhatsApp to work, coordinate their, their meetings and their training and then they just started using WhatsApp to send information about sexual health and rights, how to use contraceptive, different contraceptive methods and where to get them, et cetera, through WhatsApp. So we're like, what? Now they, they feel empowered and they're actually using uh, WhatsApp, they're using a tool to empower themselves and inform themselves. So we jumped on the opportunity to see if we could uh, find out if we could use WhatsApp as a tool to, to work with the uh, uh, youth and adolescents and to train them on how to prevent unwanted uh, pregnancy and so they would also learn about their sexual reproductive rights. Uh, what we did was that we sent out information on sexual and reproductive health and rights to two out of the, because we had 60 groups, two of the most active WhatsApp groups and they were about um, 20 people per group. And we mainly monitor actions and reactions from the information that was sent. So if there were any questions, if there were no comments that were made, how they reacted to the different videos and the images that we sent out. And uh, so we decided to analyze the effects that of WhatsApp on sharing this information. Uh, and uh, what we did, what I did in a very short amount of time is that we I had to either create or gather a massive amount of material which we did not have, we did not create ourselves necessarily to share because it was about an entire month that we did this from November, all of most of November. So for approximately 20 days, once a day, and I created more material than that for actually an entire month to send out. And um, we, in the end, we decided to mainly share video and uh, image and text material because unlike the United States and Bolivia, we don't, people don't generally have plans, like phone plans, where you can just access the internet easily. We have to pay for it. And, and young, young people, they have to, you know, separate a certain amount of money a month that they want to use to buy a car, a phone car, so they can uh, access the internet. Uh, so they really have to think about what kind of stuff they want to download. A video takes up a lot more money to download than an, an image or text. So we focus mainly on, on text and, and images for that. And well, this is some of the material that I created. I know I made, made it like PowerPoint and stuff, most of it, so you can laugh at it, it's okay. <laughs> So most of it was uh, um, different contraception methods 
uh, sexual reproductive rights, because a lot of people don't know that you know you have a right to say no and things like that. They assume that if they're in a relationship, they have like women, girls, that they, they have to say yes, they want to have sex. And uh, myth busting, uh, the, the little orange one, yellow one on the on the bottom, uh, is a question that had a lot of um, movement. Is if a woman is a virgin and she has sex for the first time, can she get pregnant? A lot of people think that they can't. And so we, we did a lot of that like myth busting. Um, that is yeah, a big question for our public. And the results uh, were that one of the WhatsApp groups, like I told you we had two, had a 70% forwarding rate, which is quite high. And linked to that, it, you can see how important it is for the actual group to be really engaged and interested in their their sexual like rights and on on their sexuality, etc. Because if they're not interested in it, then you're not going to have a lot of movements. And that's what happened, for example, on the other group. Um, so the conclusions is that working with WhatsApp low cost, but it requires a lot of information. Uh, yeah, gathering and to create yeah, information and it needs to be continued. You need to send stuff out every single day to make sure that they get the information that they are going to be checking that group over and over again and also replying to the comments and any kind of reaction that comes in. It's very important to, to be continuous with that. Um, like I said, the potential uh, for rate is, is uh, the potential share rate is going to be up to 70%. And it depends on the format, what is easily shared, and we, we didn't do audio because we quickly realized that just it wasn't going to happen. And uh, we can quickly absolve uh, any doubts and answer questions through WhatsApp quickly. Everyone, you know, you get a message, you answer it. That's as quick, quick as that. And it, yeah, it does uh, kind of cut off the, the barrier that you may have when talking about these issues face-to-face -face where you can have some indirect dialogue and yeah access to internet an internet source is vital and that's something that we might want to like do a little more research on ourselves because we they, they're not always connected and if there's like a wi-fi zone you're going to see like five thousand dollars and then it doesn't just like huddled up and trying to um use the wi-fi and uh, yeah, we, we want to minimize, we should minimize the cost access barriers to the internet. And adolescents will only share information that is interesting or fun to them. It's really important to make targeted and very specific uh, material that they will be share, they will be sharing. Um, and it should, and for us, for my past Olivia, we found out that this should be used as a complement of pain. You should not only just use WhatsApp as your main way to get to reach these, uh, this audience. You need to actually sit them down and talk about um, the issues in training, etc. And see, here are some of the uh, examples of some of the reactions that we got. Um, I shared a video on how to use a condom, and this was it was an awesome video because it was a young girl talking about how to use a condom and she did it perfectly and she was talking quickly and you've got like little different images popping on a, a, around the video and people really like that i mean they really really like that kind of um and so it's so it's really important to create this kind of material um and another reaction of another material that, that we put out is the first one the guy it says no one can force you to have sexual relationships if you don't want to you decide if you want to, when, with whom, and how. And one of the answers we got is it's not always like that. I know cases where girls are forced, and that's actually quite common in Bolivia where we have a high violence against women in rape, nine out of ten women in violence. So that's representative of what actually goes on. It goes on in you know, women's mind. It's like, well, you know, I'm in a relationship, I'm meant to have sex if my partner wants to. Second one um, says you cannot be discriminated by age, sex, um, sexual orientation, and if you have an STI. One of the responses we got was society. So we, we did get some really important <coughs> reactions 
material that we that we put out that we can definitely work on. And um,
We're a product neutral collaboration and we're really strategizing to make sure that the that NPTs are technically feasible, that they um, that investment decisions are made in, in effective and efficient ways and in alignment with priorities, and that women's voices are really meaningfully integrated into the development process. And this is a really complex, challenging effort, but we've got a lot of experts who are working together to really think through these issues. Um, and so the, we, we recognize that the last, the last kind of point that I made, that integrating women's voices into that product development process is not really traditionally how sexual reproductive health prevention product development occurs. That's just, it's usually a design idea, a formulation is kind of bought up in a lab, <coughs> and then women are asked whether or not they like a product really towards the tail end of product development, where changes in the products really, major changes can't be made, and women are asked questions more along the lines of, why didn't you use the product during that trial? As opposed to, what kind of design would you like? You know, what kind of what kind of ideas you know make sense for your lifestyle? Um, so we're really trying to change the paradigm of product development so that women can actually feel like they can use the products and want to use the products, but also that they feel empowered, that their voices are valued in this kind of in this process. Um, so, let's see. So here is kind of. Oh, it's traditionally, product development is traditionally done in a very simplistic, uh, a very simplistic graphic here, and we're trying to figure out a way to meaningfully integrate that perspective into the process and to get buy-in from the people who are funding these projects and, and carrying out the research. So this is not, again, it's not easy. Um, and we've really experienced <laughs> in kind of related fields, some serious challenges to getting women's feedback into the process. Um, so some of you may have heard of the recent microbicide gel trials, um, voice and facts, which really found that, so these are AR, anti retroviral based um, microbicide gels, um, some daily use and then some pericoidal, so around the time of sex. And what they found was that this, the, the population that they were studying, so young women, they really didn't, weren't able to use the gels consistently and um, it really didn't fit into their day-to-day -day lifestyle to, you know, for a variety of different reasons that they're still exploring, but it emphasizes the need for better methods to really get at what young women want in an, in an HIV prevention, um, innovative HIV prevention product. And then similarly, um, more recently, the microbicide ring trials came out, so these rings that are kind of like a new ring, but um, loaded with ARV drugs. Um, so they found that protection in women 21 years and older was, was actually pretty great, which was exciting for the field, but that among young women, 21 and under, the use is still fairly inconsistent. And um, again, they're still kind of digging through the data to figure out the reasons why, but again, highlights that perhaps we need to be looking at alternative methods that are more in line with the lifestyles of young women so that they're better able to take advantage of these prevention methods. Um, so these, uh, these are HIV prevention specific, but these are similar technology platforms that we're looking at for MPTs to combine with the contraceptive or um, STI prevention as well. So this is really important for our field. Um, and then I want to return back to uh, the market study that I had referenced in the beginning and show that yes, women want an MPT, um, the women surveyed really would prefer um, an starting with most preferred was an intravaginal um, or a, an implant device and then um, an injectable followed by a film and then followed by an intravaginal ring. So this is one study, um, but it did show there's a pretty big variety of products. Um, but when you look at the pipeline and what's actually in development for the MPT field, um, over one third of products in development right now where all of the investment is happening um, are intravaginal rings. So you see that while well, that study showed that women actually didn't really prefer in that setting interactional rings over other types of products, that's really what we're focusing on in the field. So um, that kind of demonstrates we need to be kind of connecting the dots here and you know, women are interested in a very diverse range of products. Um, so the, 
we have an opportunity here to really change the paradigm of how we're looking at sexual reproductive health product development. And the IMPT um, is focused on a few efforts to really um, accelerate action around these, this process. So we're developing resources for MPT funders and developers. We've been asked to do this by um, the U.S. government and um, a couple of other funders to just outline what kinds of things really need to be done and at what time to ensure that women's voices are integrated. Um, we hold meetings around these issues with appropriate stakeholders to really get it. Um, we have, we support in-country MVT task forces and priority regions to kind of make sure that the foundation and the partnerships are built to enable the right kinds of market research um, and to really educate and raise awareness around these issues. And then also we're advocating for, for increased market research for the MPT field. It's just one market study and kind of ongoing MPT development. You know, there's a lot of work that remains to be done and we'd like to be seeing really innovative methods to get at particularly what young women want because this is a, po a population that really is, has the highest unmet need worldwide. So <coughs> that's something that we really care about and we'd like to continue to partner with people to strategize around it. I would invite you, and I'm talking very fast, but if you're interested, I'd invite you to come up and talk to me and get involved if you have ideas um, and join our network of experts, which is on um, the IMPT website. And I will leave it at that. Thanks very much. services that we can provide without there uh, being a diagnosis in place. 
Um, so it's a great way to kind of use pharmacists out in the community to make sure that we're providing these services as needed. One of those is hormonal birth control, as well as immunization, smoke immunization, <coughs> travel medicine, and any kind of test we can order as well. And there's a new category of pharmacists where we'll have a licensed diet of advanced practice pharmacists where we can initiate, modify, discontinue medication uh, treatments in collaboration with other providers. And uh, as you may know that Oregon also has passed a law allowing pharmacists to prescribe birth control. And our laws are a little bit different. So here in California, the pharmacist can prescribe birth control pills, patch, ring, and the depo injection for women of any age, whereas in Oregon, um, if the patient is below 18, there has to be proof of a prior prescription. And they're only doing birth control pills and the patch. And that kind of leads into, we wanted to study this, so now that we have this new law and new service available, it actually uh, went into place just a couple of weeks ago here in California. Uh, so we want to talk to teens and see what are their perceptions of pharmacies and pharmacists, um, what are their experiences with accessing birth control, and what do they think about going directly to the pharmacy for this, either for themselves or just broadly as a service available to other teens. So we recruited 18 and 19 year old uh, females in California on Facebook. Um, our IRB didn't allow us to recruit um, minors. And we spoke with them over the phone. Um, no personal information was collected, so we spent about 20, 30 minutes on the phone with each of them. And we spoke to 30 different women, uh, half 18-year-olds and half 19-year-olds. That's just what they worked out. And you can see most of the patient or participants, I should say, were in suburban areas. Um, we had a good mix of Hispanic, white, Asian, not as much of the other ethnicities and races, and education level, everybody had graduated high school, and um, many of them had also started college. <coughs> so there were five themes that emerged from this research, um, the first being issues around the traditional care model. Many of these uh, young women express that they're very satisfied with their current provider, but they're also challenges. So we saw a mix there, um, and you can see some of the quotes here. Um, you know, I go to my doctor every three months to get my birth control. It would be a lot more convenient if I could just go to the pharmacy. Um, another participant said, you don't always have time, and going to the doctor is expensive. So there definitely are barriers with the current model. The second theme was around the environment within the pharmacy. And there was a major theme, or, you know, sub-theme around pharmacy confidentiality and privacy, clearly. <laughs> so a lot of participants expressed that it would be really nice if there was a private room or a back area where I could speak to the pharmacist and others wouldn't overhear our conversations. Um, others said, you know, to make it youth friendly, it'd be helpful to have signs advertising or marketing this new service. Um, the good news is that teens do see pharmacists as knowledgeable and um, adults that they can trust, so they, they feel like they're in a position of trust and that they're knowledgeable, which is great. Um, and they feel like if their pharmacist just takes the time to listen, then they can definitely have a meaningful exchange. Um, and just the convenience of it's a lot easier to pop in the pharmacy with so many of them around. And then another theme emerged around just the preferences around the birth control service. So a lot of um, women were kind of specific about, well, I need to make sure that the pharmacist is going to pick the right birth control for me, or how are they going to know what's going to work with my body? Um, so that's, that's an important um, element for them. <laughs> Others uh, mentioned that if it doesn't affect the cost, then it pays the same, I have to pay the same amount, then I'm totally unopposed to this. Um, and there were some safety concerns that emerged. So uh, one participant, you can see their quote here, I'm worried about people getting it, maybe not for themselves, but for other people. Um, and then the issue of insurance confidentiality came up as well. They want to be able to use their insurance without their uh, parents or um, guardians being aware of that. And the next theme was around their personal benefits and concerns. So a lot of the participants were able to kind of um, articulate that I think this is really great. And we actually spoke with a woman who was um, pregnant, and she said, I probably wouldn't be pregnant right now if I had this option of going straight to the pharmacy um, and not involving my parents, which would be ideal. Um, others kind of talked about their peers. I know a lot of my friends or a lot of other people I know, their parents' religious beliefs prohibit them from being able to use birth control, so this could potentially be a great avenue for them to access these products. Um, and then surprisingly, the last thing was a lot around social impact. And I was a little bit surprised by this. I don't work as directly with teens as much as adults. 
um, but they're very articulate in talking about the impact on unintended pregnancies and teens and how this is really going to help kind of public health outcomes in, um, in our country. So I thought that was um, pretty impressive. <laughs> they also felt that having it available in more areas would normalize it. Um, and importantly, would provide access for younger teens who sometimes have more barriers than adults. So how can we address these study findings? Um, definitely pharmacies, as they're thinking about implementing the service, they can take into consideration a lot of the design, making sure there's a private space and the way they're interacting with teens and, and marketing the service. Um, and we're definitely integrating a lot of this in the training that we're doing here in California. Um, but we definitely need partnerships with both other healthcare providers so that if their patient mentions, oh yeah, I, I went to the pharmacy for my refills last time, that that healthcare provider responds positively to that so that we're kind of talking each other up as if we're saying, oh, well, you don't need to do that, just come back and see me. Um, because it really can be, I think, a win-win for other providers because those patients are coming to the pharmacy and they may need referrals for either STI screening or maybe they'd like to use a LARP device. And so it can really be a two-way exchange um, and not, not really a trip board. Um, and definitely with community organizations and advocates like yourselves to help spread the word that this is now available. So let's see here from all of you. Thanks so much for listening. Um, you can follow us on our hashtag, hashtag YTH Live, as well as on Twitter at YTH Org for more updates. Thanks so much.